Hello, welcome to Crux Investor. We caught up with Ali Haji, who is the CEO of TSXV Listed Ion Energy. They have got a lithium brine project in Mongolia on the Chinese border. He talks us through how they're going to tackle that project this year with funds available to them and runs us through what the team's experience is in the country. Interesting conversation. If you want our thoughts and opinions on it, uh, on the company itself, uh, you can find that at correctsinvestor.com forward slash club, where you can also find detailed company reports and analysis. There are commentaries from experts from around the world on a variety of macro themes, companies and commodities, which you might find insightful. There are training courses on them to help you with your own diligence process. Plus, we have summaries of interviews that we've done just to save you some time because we know you're busy. And if you want to join a thriving community, of investors sharing their thoughts and ideas with each other in a nice, friendly and safe environment, free from judgment, trolling and abuse, uh, go and join them at cruxinvestor.com forward slash club. And we'd love your feedback too. So do give us a like. It'd be appreciated if your thoughts below. We'll get back to everyone. And if you want to see precisely what we talked about with Ali today, take a look in the description below. Ali, how are you doing, sir? Pretty well, Matt. Thanks for having me. How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. I think you're going to be our, the last lithium company we interviewed for Lithium Week, which was last week. So welcome aboard. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, fantastic. So where are you? I'm in Toronto. Um, we're just coming out of sort of the, the lockdown phases here. So retail is finally opening back up. Some sort of normalcy returning to daily life. Uh, so, so can't quite complain. <gasps> fantastic. I, I, I listened to that with great jealousy. We're, we're about a month away. Um, right. Well, look, we're going to hear your story uh, today. We're going to ask you a few questions about what your plans are. But before we do, give us that one minute overview of the business and I'll pick it up from there. You got it. Uh, Ion Energy is an early stage lithium brine explorer in Mongolia. Uh, we formed the company back in 2017, uh, August, and sort of when we were advising a, a step company going public. Um, we looked at the battery metals industry, decided that, uh, in fact, much like everything else, uh, you know, battery metals are cyclical or resources are cyclical. Let's look for uh, lithium in Mongolia, Mongolia being as vast as it is, a country in which we have a fair bit of experience. Uh, we began the process of identifying lithium in country back then in 2019. We were granted uh, an 81,000 hectare license uh, of uh, potential lithium brine. It is uh, extremely close to the Chinese border and the largest land package ever given to a public or private company by the government in Mongolia. So it's uh, an extremely exciting uh, prospect that we're, we're currently uh, working on exploring. Absolutely. Okay. Lithium so sort of seen a little bump in the last three, four months. Uh, equity prices have been shooting up. Price of lithium, all the different variations of lithium are, are going up too. So in terms of timing, very topical, but do you think... What, Actually, do you know what? Let's let's start with the plan. What, what did you set out to uh, achieve? Because this is, and I get the 2017 component, but really this took off halfway through last year. Yeah, absolutely. So 2019, we were granted the license. Would have loved to be public by PDAC, uh, but then we were dealt with the pandemic. And I think as a company, we sort of saw it coming back. So Battery Metal is making a comeback. Uh, last summer was was instrumental in really pushing that, that equity market forward. Uh, we got our conditional approval from TX, TSX in April of last year. Uh, went public in August of last year. And since then, we've been trading on uh, the TSX Venture on the ticker ION. Um, and we went public on the back of the, the renewed interest, we'd say, uh, in battery metals, mostly prompted by government spending. Uh, but when we started trade back in uh, in August, uh, we, we were pretty slow out of the gate. And as, you, as you so rightly pointed out, the last few months have been uh, rather compelling. Uh, it would be foolish not to look at the equity markets in the lithium space. I think uh, it, it's one of two reasons, one being the fact that uh, you know, there's a lot of retail uh, sentiment that's being poured into these these companies, uh, vastly around uh, the successes or, or the overvaluation of, of certain electric vehicle manufacturers that are now catching up to, to, to where they should be. Uh, but ultimately, everybody's been uh, been able to benefit off of the renewed interest in battery metals. And much like ourselves, I think you know we went public at uh, a fairly low valuation of 15 million post money. Uh, we were able to sort of fill that gap through through execution uh, over the last uh, four or five months that we've been trading, uh, and, and we rode that wave in January. I think, you know, it'd be uh, it'd be silly not to admit that. So uh, we did have some some real good trading days, some really good uh, increments in price. Uh, we still believe we're undervalued relative to where we should be, given our our, our asset, um, our proximity to market, and our team. Uh, but the markets are, are in fact, uh, I think, steadying uh, in the last couple of days. They, they are steadying, but you know, normally CEOs, I expect them to say that, but it's, it's such early days. You haven't really done anything. I get the big land package and I get that it's next door to China, but you haven't done anything yet. So 
I mean, talk to me, talk to me about what it is that you're trying to build and the process that you're going to go through to get to that point. Absolutely. So we added on a gentleman by the name of Don Haynes, uh, and we'll talk to his experience in just a second. But uh, we commenced exploration in October of last year. Uh, it is a very early stage project. We, there have only been a couple of drills, drill holes on the project uh, thus far uh, in recent history. And uh, we've shown grades of up to 811 ppm in some cases. Uh, the impurities, so the potassiums and the like, are, are fairly low. Um, and the exploration program that commenced in October includes a geophysics CSAMT program uh, along two line strikes, eight by 12 kilometers along on two targets. Uh, those will give us the conductivity of uh, near surface uh, ore, if you will. Um, and then we'll move on to uh, micro seismic. So micro seismic will give us the thickness, the depth and the potential width of those aquifer bodies beneath surface. Uh, after which point we'll, de we'll be deploying our truck mounted auger rig. So we acquired that back in 2019, it's on site. Uh, it's capable of going down to 20 meters to pull up the brine samples that we believe are, are beneath there. So you're absolutely right, Matt, it is early days. Uh, but the prospectivity of the license and the study of the geological um, sort of makeup of, of the license are quite promising thus far. Why Mongolia? Mongolia is a country that we've been in for over 10 years. Uh, my chairman, Matt Wood, sort of went in there early days and looked for, uh, uh, he ended up there in 2009, actually. He's a gold geologist by trade, uh, Rio Tinto scholar. Uh, he's founded multiple uh, companies around the world and exited. Uh, but when he went in in 2009, he looked for uh, gold. He just happened to be there during the last coal boom and in fact ended up accumulating a number of coal assets as a back, on the back of uh, 20 million Aussie that he raised on the ASX. Uh, when he acquired these assets, he de-risked them significantly um, and built, them, uh, built a package essentially that he would then exit uh, to Banpu of Thailand for half a billion dollars 18 months later. So uh, that, that was really our first foray into Mongolia. Uh, it's a country that we know quite well. We've always operated as local operators. So everything Matt's done there has been staffed by uh, Mongolians. In fact, half my board is Mongolian. Um, and we, we uh, in essence, have a history and country. Uh, beyond that, uh, in 2016, right prior to, to founding ION, um, I was out there advising a company by the name of Step Gold. Uh, Step Gold is today a commercial producer. Um, and, and again, 99-98% uh, of the staff is Mongolian, uh, the, half the board is Mongolian. Uh, it's, it's truly a country that we know quite well, that's extremely underexplored. So only 3% of the company or the country has been explored, uh, which means, yeah, you know, you, you have the likes of Oyu Tolgoi, uh, Rio Tinto, massive copper gold deposit there. Uh, the resource richness of the country has yet to be uh, really developed and understood. Uh, and, and we're fairly comfortable working in that country. And as a result of that, we've uh, we focused primarily on Mongolia. Right. Okay. So it's dent, dent of history is, is why you're there. But the experience lends you to believe that you can operate in, in the future um, on, on this project. It's a very large land package. Why did you go for so much? Why did we go for so much? It's the end of Eric Basin uh, that, that it really excited us. I think one of the things that we've seen in, in the lithium triangle is you might have a number of different companies share that uh, end of Eric Basin. And ultimately, you know, the analogy that if everybody is, li likely the folks that have seen me speak about this before will, will, will know this saying that I like to use. And it's ultimately whoever has the longest straw drinks the juice. Uh, in our case, it's one cup, one straw. So having control of the entire basin was what we went after um, when the government was, was working to put it up for tender. Uh, and we believe that controlling that, that basin in its, in its entirety helps to, to monopolize the company somewhat as far as control to lithium in that basin region uh, in the South Gobi. So under what terms have you picked it up? One, what did it cost you and how much money are you expected to spend over what period of time? Because most governments would expect you to spend money or relinquish property. Indeed, indeed. And the Mongolian government uh, is, is much like any other government in mining jurisdictions. So you would look at uh, spending a minimum amount for exploration each year. Um, the fees associated with that are quite minimal. In fact, they're 50 cents per hectare um, to show that you've spent on an annual basis when you're in the exploration phase. You can carry an exploration license for three and a half years, apply for renewal of that exploration license three and a half years later, and then ultimately move to, to a development uh, uh, license beyond that. Uh, mining and then development beyond that. So in, in our case, uh, we raised $2.7 million when we went public last year. Um, that was sufficient to cover our exploration costs on Balvaio, at least the early stage uh, exploration, including auger sampling and, and geophysics and CSAMT. That would cost us about $1.2 million. We paid for now half of that. Um, Mongolia is a relatively cheap jurisdiction to work in. 
because of mining, and we paid for half of that now. So we expect to spend the rest of it over the course of this year, uh, and we very well may accelerate that a tad uh, as we as we progress through the year on the back of the renewed interest in battery metals. So we've talked about Bob Hayol, and that is you know indeed our flagship license at eighty one thousand hectares. Uh, but as of two three weeks ago now, we acquired Urga Khnaren. Urga Khnaren is Rising Sun. Uh, that's how it literally translates from Mongolian, so quite appropriate. And that resides in the Dorngovi province, so one province uh, uh, west uh, from, from Sukhvatar. That's 19,000 hectares, so we currently control about 100,000 hectares in land. That's great. Um, at some point, you're going to need to start raising money in an environment which, as you say, is quite buoyant. Battery metals mm -hmm. in general, buoyant. Lithium at the moment, buoyant. Until there's oversupply. So how do you think you've timed this? What gives you confidence that the market's going to be there for you when you need to go and raise capital? I think, uh, you know, we've, as you rightly pointed out, buoyant. And we've had uh, a number of instances where we've been offered capital uh, at these levels and we've had to respectfully turn them down. Um, as a junior miner, is that the wisest decision? You might be chuckling, <laughs> but uh, we have to be quite, quite sensitive to, to shareholder dilution and shareholder value. Uh, we know that we raised uh, sufficient capital to explore and de-risk Bavaiol, uh, and we know we have a bid in the coffers to, to look after Urga Khnaren. But we did issue a, uh, a warrant, a full warrant, when we went public, price at 40 cents. We've been trading in and around the 50 to 60 mark for the last little while here. So those have started to organically convert and recapitalize the treasury. Uh, that allows us to, to fully explore, if they were all to convert, uh, both projects in a, in a more accelerated uh, timeline. Uh, but we also have a focus of, of mirroring what Matt did with Hunu, which is uh, to acquire additional licenses in country and ultimately have a controlling stake in, in, in the majority of lithium bearing licenses in country. So our, our goal there um, would be to, to potentially look at financing at a future date um, at a higher currency uh, on the back of the valuation gap that we believe is yet to be filled. Uh, and that additional capital would help uh, execute on the acquisition and exploration strategies. It's interesting because you've got lots of, it's so early, you've got lots of routes you can take, lots of options that you, you, you can go down. And it's very hard for me to you know, unpick what it is that you're doing because you've, you've got to make those, you've yet to make a lot of those decisions. So talk to me about the, the team's experience and give me a sort of sense of what sort of business model you might be employing going forward. Sure. So when we talked about Hunu, that was purely a, an acquisition, de-risk and an exit strategy. ION is going to be following a very similar strategy uh, in that we will be acquiring assets that have had some work done on them, de-risk further, and then bring in a strategic or a major to take either a majority JV stake or, or an ultimate exit entirely. Uh, it is not our hope as a company to bring these assets to production ourselves. Uh, we don't believe that we would be able to do so in, in the current environment, but we'd also want a strategic uh, to come in with the necessary experience to, to take things forward. Uh, as far as the team is concerned, you know, we've had um, a multitude of, of uh, mining investment professionals on our team. I'll talk about myself first. I've had over 11 years of experience at Invesco. Uh, I started my career as an IT asset management analyst in Toronto. I sort of put on the special acquisition team and moved to Hong Kong to acquire AIG's real estate business. I then moved over back to Toronto to work on Morgan Stanley Van Campen's acquisition by Invesco. I worked on a number of strategic objectives to, to make Invesco a global entity because it operated as a, a sort of separate, um, a, a company with separate entities around the world. Uh, beyond that, I was put uh, in London. I, I lived in London for three and a half years, uh, co-leading a center of excellence in the investment operations space. So you might ask, you know, wh where's my mining experience? And that's a valid question because you do require mining experience to, to run a mining company as, I, as I'm doing today. Uh, my father has been in mining since 1998. Uh, we've had some very, very uh, low grade copper uh, mines in, in, in Zambia that we've shipped uh, concentrate over to China. So it's sort of in my blood, if you will. Um, my chairman, Matthew Wood, a uh, serial mining entrepreneur by trade, uh, an individual that has uh, founded, uh, funded, uh, moved to, to production and then exited multiple companies around the world. Uh, Hunu Cole is uh, really one of his first forays into Mongolia that I mentioned earlier, was a $20 million IPO on the ASX and then a half a billion dollar exit 18 months later. But he's also the founding chairman of a bank called Resources in Brazil that sold to Oz Minerals for 440 million in March 2018. He's also the founding uh, chairman of Stepgold, who is now a, a commercial producer in Mongolia, producing 60,000 ounces annualized. So uh, that's the, the sort of entrepreneurial and geological background that comes from Matt. And it's a very, very rare thing to find, uh, I think, where you have a strong geo geologist with a strong entrepreneurial capacity. 
the second individual on our uh, board, uh, Matt uh, Bata Tumur Ocher, he is one of two Mongolians on my board. Uh, he is a special advisor to the Minister of Mines. He was with the previous government, reappointed with the existing government, so speaks to our ability to be uh, politically agnostic in country, if you will. But he's also the chief executive of Step Gold today. Uh, Anil Varaj is a board member. He's an uh, ex-investment banker, Goodman Dundee, uh, helped fund some of the deals uh, that, that I think you would have been talked to talking about over the course of the battery week, uh, including Namaska. Uh, he's raised over a billion dollars in the capital market space in the last uh, 12 years or so. So really strong capital markets experience there. And Tushin Kishik Surin, he is our uh, second Mongolian director. He is a, uh, uh, an exploration guru, if you will, has spent a fair bit of time exploring the Eurasian region, uh, credited with finding multi-million ounce gold deposits uh, along the border with uh, Russia as well. So, you know, you, you might be asking yourself, where's the lithium experience? And that, that's all uh, extremely valid. We added uh, on the tail end of us going public, we added uh, Paul Fornatsari as our, our uh, one of our advisors. Paul Fornatsari was the original chairman at Lithium Americas. Uh, he was a director at Neo Lithium uh, and he's a partner at FASC and he led their, their, their LATAM mining group, uh, global mining group. So he's the individual that brings in that, that real strategic sort of uh, start to finish uh, acquisition through the exit uh, uh, scenario for us. He's helping us develop uh, as a company where we will be in, in, in the coming uh, years, uh, as well as uh, helping us through our acquisition strategy as we start to, to execute. It strikes me that team is a team who likes to do deals. And this is a team constructing a, a, a business, not necessarily a lithium business. It doesn't matter to you, I suppose, if it's a lithium business or not. It just happens to be the case here. Um, certainly with your experience, and if, if, you know, if, even if I look at Matt Wood, you know, I think the honey deal was huge, but that was what turned around in what, over what period of time? 18 months. 18 months, yeah, right? So period. this is deal. So he wasn't driving value onto the ground per se. It was, it was about the construction of deals. So I'm just wondering, again, I want to know what I'm buying into here. And I've no yeah, problem with it because there's lots of ways you can play this. I just want to know which way you're playing it so I can yeah. jump on board if I'm comfortable, right? So Absolutely. So you've got a large land package. So the, the, the view is what? Go, keep raising money, diluting, but building value or, uh, it, through drilling, exploration, and so forth. Or you're bringing in earning partners uh, who can bring the capital in because you sit on, you own the land, right? So, yeah. what 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 is the what is the game plan here? The game plan is ultimately that of you know de-risking today with the current capital in the bank, uh, bringing in additional capital to allow us to do a little bit more work on the ground. Uh, beyond that, it would be a JV type scenario. So you know, bring in the likes of a, a CATL or bring in the likes of, of that could be Neo uh, out in China that, that's looking for an offtake style agreement. Uh, those individuals or those parties would ultimately help uh, fund further with an ownership stake and then be a, a sort of rofer, if you will, um, when it comes time to. To, to exit as, as an acquisition or, or a, a divestiture. Right. Okay. But there, there's, a, you know what I mean? There's a kind of, there's a market play. There's the big headlines that you need. Spend a little bit of money. I'm not sure it's going to get cattle in here. So, you know, how much more money, how much more time from you before you can genuinely have a conversation from a cattle or a gang fang or any of the other kind of players you might want exposure to close to China? Yeah, I would expect that towards the end of the year, we'd be ready to have those conversations. Um, that's uh, quicker than, than most, you know, going from, from sort of exploration to, to understanding your resource would be, uh, or, or even going into production would be six to 10 years uh, for most mines in the lithium space. And for us, it's more so we can look to de-risk a little quicker, one on the back of uh, you know the solid in-country team that's a bit that's able to execute on exploration uh, but beyond that uh, i think if you look at the the the, the brine or the ultimate uh, geological features of this this under eric basin uh, what we're told is once we're be once we're done our, our geophysics once we're done our csamt and we're going out there with our auger rig we're able to pull up a number of different samples from beneath surface, uh, getting an average sort of grade across that, that endoheric basin, uh, given the, the volume of that uh, aquifer. Uh, we could quite rudimentarily say, you know, this is our estimated resource. It's not bankable. It's not a pre-feasibility. It's, it's one that's on the back of raw data that, that shows us uh, ultimately what the volume would be multiplied by the average grade. Uh, at that point, you start to get these majors interested. Um, you know, for companies that will remain unnamed today, 
um, there are groups in China and internationally that are currently acquiring. Uh, it may not have to be battery grade just yet, but they will do the refining on their end and ultimately bring it into their production uh, spheres or, or, or through vertical integration. So our intent is, you know, let's get them in early on uh, around the end of this year when we've done a fair bit of work to de-risk. Uh, we, we can accelerate those programs over the course of the summer with the warmer months. And uh, our currency will react accordingly when we put out the news to market. And uh, we'd expect to have them sort of participate uh, or at least begin early conversations towards the end of the year. So... It feels like you're kind of shortcutting a few processes there, because if I do look at the millennial lithiums, the neo lithiums, oh. the lithium Americas, all these kind of brine projects in, in South America, you're coming at it differently. You're in the what, South Go- Gobi Desert region, so it's, it's kind of com- comparable uh, in, in many, many ways. But they've taken a long time to get to the point where they're comfortable having those sorts of conversations. But what gives you confidence that you can encourage some of the bigger players to come in and talk to you at that point? And on what basis? Yeah, proximity to market is a big one. Uh, you know, China being the consumer that it is, the behemoth that it is, uh, with 53% uh, of all uh, uh, lithium being consumed by the country, 73% of batteries being produced by the country, 80% of lithium being refined in country for uh, use around the world. Uh, Europe's playing this massive catch-up game massive catch-up game and they, they quite rightly have to do so as a result of uh, the, the carbon taxes that are going to come into play in short order here. Uh, what we've seen is that, that while we're, we're this close to the behemoth and, and we know that um, you know supply is is less is greater than demand, uh, rather supply is less than demand today, we've seen that in the increment in prices uh, for lithium carbonates uh, and other lithium byproducts in China already. I think Benchmark mentioned 68% in the last week or so. So seeing that uptick and knowing that uh, the the demand is increasing and that the, you know China is right beside us is quite exciting to us. It tells us that they're going to want to come in at some point to secure their supplies. Uh, very recently, Ganfeng put um, a brine asset in production in China, uh, or they invested a fair bit of money in, in a Chinese brine asset. So we're starting to see a fair bit of interest uh, come in from that regard. The folks that we've added to the team with the likes of uh, Paul Fornazari, as well as some other relationships that we've built along the way in the last 10 years, have the necessary relationships to bring us in front of those strategics. Um, so, so we expect to have those conversations in and around the end of the year. Right, and are these just conversations or are these something more meaningful? It's uh, l- likely, you know, we wouldn't be having them if we didn't think they would be meaningful. Um, no, but I mean financially. I you know, lots, yeah, lots yeah. of companies talk about we're talking to people all of the time because we want to know what the potential is and when. Of course. You know, you've got to keep financing this thing. So you may raise some money. You've got a little bit of money now. You may raise a little bit of money this year to accelerate an exploration plan. But to be able to do a kind of back of a napkin type resource guesstimate um, mm-hmm. to be able to have these conversations. So will those conversations allow you to go and get more capital because you know that you, at least people are listening or do you think you can talk to these sorts of chinese players who perhaps are used to shortcutting processes and get them to start putting money on the table yeah i think we'd get them in for a toehold right uh, have them take a, a chunk of the company today um, have a vested interest in our success uh, that would ultimately allow them to be an offtake partner and then ultimately either an acquirer or, or, or a majority JV partner as we as, as we look to, to exit. How do you think the market would react to having a Chinese partner on your... It's, uh, you know, that's a, an interesting question, Matt. And, and I say this because uh, Mongolia is sandwiched by Russia and China. Um, the Russians and the Chinese are, are, are the Eastern powers that be. Uh, the relationships with the West are... are, are, are I don't want to call them strained, but they're they're not as strong as as they what they once were or, or will ever be. I think, in my view, uh, so. Mongolia has what's called a uh, third neighbor policy today. Uh, and what that is, is they would incentivize us working with additional countries outside of China or Russia. Uh, so as a result of that, the taxes would be less. We know that the Germans have a fantastic relationship with Mongolia. Um, and they lovingly refer to it as Mongolai. Uh, but, uh, you know, Mon- BMW has been in country. BMW has looked for lithium in country. We know BMW is one of those countries at the forefront of developing their own cells uh, in, in Europe. Uh, and on the back of that, while the Chinese might be, you know, the, the potential suitor because of their proximity to our asset, uh, I think the options are, are still still uh, vastly available to us uh, in terms of who might uh, be the potential uh, JV partner or, or suitor uh, in the future. China is the natural fit, purely based on proximity. But I think that there's potential upside to that as well. Right. How long do you think you're going to be involved with the company? 
I'm going to be involved until exit, I believe. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's sort of my baby. I co-founded this thing. Um, management and insiders, we all hold a significant chunk of the company. We've all put in capital at every level uh, from founding to, to, to IPO. We own 36% of the company today. We're fully escrowed for uh, two years, so we cannot sell, assign, or transfer a single share for two years. That's by design to align with our uh, our exit strategy, and um, we're not planning on going anywhere. Uh, this is uh, this is we're in this for the long haul, and we're in this for our shareholders. I like that. Two year hold, nice. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It was one year, but we pushed back and said we want two. That's great news. That's yeah. very encouraging. Uh, I wish more people would do that, quite frankly. Um, and if you got any sort of big names in there outside of the 36, 36% help by management? There's family offices that uh, came in on the IPO that own about 8% of the company. We have uh, uh, Maxit Capital owns 2%. We have Bob Sanger, uh, Steve Palmer of Alpha North in Canada. He owns uh, 3%. Uh, Greg Schofield, who's Spartan Funds, he owns 3% as well. So it, it's really a mixed bag in terms of uh, uh, the the actual shareholders, in terms of strategic, nothing just yet. Uh, but I would expect that that may change in the coming months, as, as you, you rightly pointed out. Uh, you know, it, it's important to, to strike when the iron's hot. Um, and we think that that time is is, is coming upon us. Okay. You took, you're talking at the moment in PowerPoint about a lithium brine. You've got Paul on, who's kind of got the relevant experience. We're hearing a lot at the moment about DLE as well. I mean, again, it's early stage. You've probably got options ahead mm -hmm. of you. So what are you, what are you thinking with regards to the actual technology? Or is that going to be someone else's problem? It's, uh, it's, it's early stage to speculate until we get a true understanding of the brine as to whether or not it will be, in fact, you know, the, your typical um, evaporation process or a DLE process. Uh, but we have the likes of Don Haynes, who's uh, extremely technical. He's done uh, work all around the world, including uh, LATAM. He has been to Mongolia on three separate occasions. He's looked for lithium in China. Uh, so we understand and the different uh, types of brine uh, around the world and, and lithium around the world. We've added Dr. Hashbat uh, Tserin. He is a PhD lithium hydrogeologist from the University of Science and Technology in Mongolia. He lives in Ulaanbaatar. He spent a significant amount of time in Japan at Akita University uh, learning the extraction methodologies of the types of lithium in Mongolia. So it's still far too early to talk about whether we're bringing in somebody to help uh, with this. Uh, I think um, ultimately there are a number of different groups that uh, uh, you, you would rightly understand reach out to me on a regular basis to have us test their technology. Uh, but I think until we have a better understanding of, of where we are, um, it, it's too early to see. Okay, we've also interviewed a few companies that have tried to operate in Mongolia, haven't quite worked out. Um, what are the restrictions? What are the problematic areas of doing business in country, given your experience? Sure. Uh, Mongolia is, uh, you know, it's had its it bad press. Um, and I think most jurisdictions can say the same. Uh, with respect to Mongolia and where it is today, you know, I, I've been there seven times since 2017. Um, I've uh, met with different government officials at different levels and different political parties. And each one of them has told me the, the exact same story, which is we've learned from our mistakes. Uh, you know, we're looking to, to, to be more transparent and we want this to be a big part of the economy going forward. It's one of the fastest growing economies in the world today. Um, it is also a, uh, an economy that's driven by mining. So 20% of their GDP comes from mining. Uh, it's a really big part of, of, of uh, their GDP. And as, on the back of that, uh, you know, we've had a lot of support from the government. If you look at back in 2017 or 16, we went to acquire ATO from Sentara when I was advising STEP. Uh, that was a company that uh, we were able to, to get permitted uh, quite quickly. I think quicker than you would say most get permitted in, in better jurisdictions, quote unquote. Quote. Um, and uh, for, for that mine to go from IPO in 2018 to commercial producer in June last year during the, the middle of the pandemic, uh, allowing you know the importation of, of cyanide, cyanide from China when the borders are closed, tells you that the government is working with us and is a strong sort of believer of, of everything that we're doing. Uh, beyond that, um, uh, the, the government of Mongolia put in $3 million uh, US into STEP as their first sovereign wealth fund investment. So for them to support us in that regard tells us that the country has, in fact, learned from their mistakes. They granted us the largest land package ever known to, to, to the country in terms of exploration. Um, so that's another tick in their, their, their corner. Uh, and we've sort of had to 
nourish and build that relationship. And the way we've done so is by telling them that we would do certain things and, and executing on them. And we have the same philosophy with our shareholders. So we said we'd take Step Public in 2018. It was a difficult market when resources were sort of well out of fashion. Everybody was too focused on crypto and cannabis or whatever it may have been. Um, the only gold mining IP on the main board that year uh, for production last year. And then with ION 2020, before sort of uh, the hoopla that we've seen in the last three months of, of the equity markets around battery metals, we still executed on our promise to go public. Um, so I think having that, that sort of two-way relationship with government um, and uh, the transparency that they're providing to us and, and other uh, operators in country uh, makes Mongolia a very promising jurisdiction. You're an advisor to STEP, and obviously Matt. I was. Yes. You, you were. You're not. In, you're full time now on this. Yeah, Ion is my full time job. Great. That's where I was going because I, I think obviously STEP has sort of seen a little um, a comeback, as it were, uh, with the rise of gold last year. They're doing doing quite well. So as Matt, uh, obviously, he gives you as much time as he can afford to. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. We're we're a very close knit management team. Uh, we work very closely together. We speak, you know, very regularly on all matters uh, ion related. Um, everybody has a seat at the table and, and that's a big driver of of, uh, of how we get things done in country. Brilliant. Okay. So what are we looking forward to in 2021? Give, us, give me those highlights. 2021 will be, you know, executing our exploration uh, strategies and, and completing them. I, I think that's paramount, uh, ensuring that they, they happen unhindered. Uh, beyond that, being able to tell uh, the market what our early resource estimate uh, might be uh, on the back of our uh, uh, exploration programs. We've also looked at additional licenses for acquisition in country, uh, so we might be making some announcements in that regard. Uh, there, have, there are outcrops of uh, spodumene uh, in country, so it could very well be a hard rock uh, acquisition that, that uh, we would look to add to our portfolio. But I think ultimately de-risking uh, Baba Yul, uh, commencing exploration on uh, ensuring that we're, we're at a currency that is uh, more attuned to what the analysts have said about us, um, and then speaking with strategics closer to the end of the year. How are you going to deliver the, uh, the what? How are you going to help the market understand what the early resource could be? Because the exchanges are going to have a, a view on that, aren't they? So <laughs> yeah. here are some numbers. If you multiply some yeah. of these, you can sort of work out what we've got. How's yeah, the conversation no, it, go? It's it's going to be a tricky one uh, to say the least. I mean, it's not forty three one one compliant, as you pointed out, but uh, it's one that I think. As a company offering full transparency, if we were to produce, uh, you know, exploration results on an ongoing basis, those with with technical knowledge, uh, which is sort of the, the folks that we want to bring to the table towards the end of the year, will begin to, to dissect and, and better understand and interpret the data uh, in order to see value in what we're putting out. So constant news flow with respect to our exploration programs. We're not going to hold back uh, on, on anything that we, we start to put forward uh, or start to see, and that'll allow folks to build their own opinion of what uh, uh, of what the asset truly truly involves. Do you think you could have done this without going pu uh, public? Could have, yes. But uh, having uh, the when you are public and eight percent of your shareholders are Mongolian, uh, you know you're checking off that box that says we said we'd be public in 2020. Here we are, and eight percent of our investors are Mongolian. So showing them some return as well to get that bilateral support in country. Great, Ali, fantastic. Thanks for coming and telling us that story. It's one of those. Uh, younger stories in the lithium space, but uh, hopefully you're timing it right. Thank you, Matt. It's been a pleasure.